Um, yay. Okay. Um, yeah, in case anyone didn't hear it, put your name and your email in the chat. Um, if you want a coalition so gift card, um and where you're based at it. And can you hear what? that? Can you hear that? No, I can't. <laughs> That's weird. Mm -mm. It used to work, so I'm not really sure what's up with that. I think Zoom's like upgraded their technology to like eliminate like background noise now. And so oh. the elevator music is background noise, even though it's not background noise. Do you think that also totally just cutting in and breaking up everything? Sarah, take some more time to prepare because we have to solve the elevator music. Do you think that if we logged in and played it on the... Oh, I can't log in and do it on the computer because then it's going to break in to the shop music that's playing in the shop right now. We'll figure out technology at some point. Or not. Or You're never. Right. You're right. It's okay. Um, okay. If anyone else starts popping in, I will admit them in here. Um, and I should get a little pop-up. Um I don't see Jess from True, but um, I am Evan, despite what the label down here says. I'm not the real Jen Karecki. That's the real Jen Karecki, our CEO. But I am Evan. I use she, her pronouns, also Aya. Um, and I am the Coalition Clubhouse headmistress. So I am the one posting in the clubhouse and telling you not to forget about Backcountry Beta. Um, and I'm excited to see. You all here, any new people keep putting in, yeah, where you're at in the chat and your email. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited for our fourth season of Backcountry Beta in partnership with True Gear. Um, this is a free event that we put on each year. Um, something a little different in last seasons and in this season is that there's an option when you register into Backcountry Beta um, to have a basically a donation and those are going to go to a different um, nonprofit or organization uh, each month of backcountry beta um, that goes towards promoting diversity in the outdoors. Um, but otherwise this is a free event um, and very excited that we're able to do it again. And at the end of our five sessions, we're going to choose um, one person to get a coalition snow gift card and one and also a true gift card um and each time you show up to the live event you get entered into that so that's also why i have your email there that way i can keep track of it so i'm going to hand this over to sarah from ski babes and um i'm really excited we had such a good time last year so i'm gonna hand it over to you jen you can't win <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thanks for having me again. This is so fun to be here with you. Um, we're going to do tune your body and tune your mind for winter. And I have some slides. So let me get those pulled up and uh, we'll get rolling. Here's my very busy screen. Let's see if I can get presenting happening. Okay, here we go. Uh, tune your body and mind for winter. I'm Sarah Histand. This is what I have planned for us tonight. We'll do some introductions. I want to tell you about what I mean by nervous system informed training and recreation. And then we'll talk a little bit about winter specific training. And I've got some of my favorite exercises to demo for you and or you're welcome to join me if you feel like moving a little bit tonight. Then I want to talk about weakest link syndrome briefly and activating healthy fight. And then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end, hopefully. So that's our itinerary for this little adventure. This is me, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a personal trainer and a mental health therapist, a somatic experiencing practitioner, which is what I'm gonna lean on a lot for this nervous system work. Uh, I live in Anchorage, Alaska, here on Denina land. I'm an outdoor athlete and this ice skating is what we're doing up here these days. It's froze, everything's frozen and we don't have snow yet. So we have incredible wild ice and it's one of my favorite times of year. So 
uh, if you ever want to come to Alaska and go ice skating with me, let me know. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about nervous system informed training and recreation. So I started this out by saying we know about mountains, right? We know about going up them and going down them. And that is essentially what we're going to talk about when we talk about nervous systems. When we are in the mountains, we're climbing up them. If you're a backcountry skier or you're riding a lift or getting up the mountain somehow, we're transitioning when we get to the top, then we're descending back down. And when we're at the bottom, hopefully we get a little time to like chill out and rest and celebrate. This is the arc of a lot of the things we do. It's the same for our warmups. We do a warm up. We for our workouts, we do a warm up. We do some intervals. We build up the intensity. We reach the peak of how hard we're working. And then hopefully on the backside, we cool down, we stretch and we recover and we make it back down to the bottom. In nervous system terms, that is the activation on the way up. The peak up at the top, we deactivate on the backside and then hopefully we integrate at the bottom. And my question for you with this in mind is which parts of that arc come easily and which ones are harder? Curious if you have any insight into that for yourself, let me know. Um, I can see the chat here. So if you want to like put some thoughts in while we're working through this, amazing. Uh, let me give you a visual beyond this one. So this is a nervous system wave, a lot like a mountain. We go up on one side, we peak, and then on the back side, we go through phases of deactivation, settling, completion, and integration. And typically with the nervous system, because we've evolved to, our bodies have evolved to keep ourselves alive, typically we go up really fast. If we run into a threat, we go up and we're ready to respond. And then our nervous systems tend to be pretty good at being like kind of high and kind of like, what's going on? What's the next problem? Am I gonna be able to, like tackle this and we tend to have a harder time with the back side of the wave of like resting and coming back down and recognizing that we're actually safe and we're okay after the thing is over so this is uh jen saying activation feels harder it's really interesting kaylee said that deactivation can be hard sometimes and Nia's kind of saying it depends on the situation, which is really actually probably the most true thing that can be said about this. Some situations might bring up a lot of activation really quickly. Some situations we might like be really chill in and it's like, actually that's a, kind of the sign of a healthy nervous system is being able to respond in different ways to different situations. So I'm gonna say that's a good sign. Uh, here's my like way that I map the workouts onto this activation cycle. We go through the you know the warm up. We do some intervals inside of my uh, winter training program, Ski Babes. We follow this pattern that you see on the screen in pink. That is like we do some warm up, so a warm up. We do some moves that are like increasingly challenging. Then we do a really hard max interval, and then to help you come down the backside of the wave, we do some balance work. We do some stretching, we finish with a dance move reward, and then we rest and drink water and give ourselves a gold star for finishing. So that's a lot of emphasis on helping the body learn to come down the backside of the wave. Yeah, okay, this comment about struggling at the peak is really, really a really good point because uh, a lot of activation at the peak can very easily be overwhelming to the nervous system. And it sounds like that especially happens to you at high exposure, which would make sense. That's a, yeah, that's accurate. I relate. Yeah. So some guiding concepts for training and recreating with the nervous system in mind. We want to try to ride this wave in as smooth a as smooth a process as possible. So one way to do that is to slow down the activation and try to like ease our way into intensity. And another way to do that is to notice how much intensity or activation in the nervous system is enough. That's some of what you're talking about here where it's like when I have 
too much activation, then I'm like overly saturated, overwhelmed, and I have trouble at that high peak. It sounds like a smaller wave would be better for that particular nervous system, a little bit less exposure maybe so that we don't end up in a place where the nervous system is stretched beyond its capacity. In general, with keeping our nervous system in mind, especially less is more, and the nervous system word for that is titration. So we're looking for like doing just little bits, moving into like a little bit of challenge, and then moving hopefully back out of it and giving the body a chance to recognize, I just did that thing and I'm okay. So that it can, you know, every time we do a little bit of a stretch of the nervous system and then we land it back into safety, then the body becomes a little bit more comfortable with that amount of activation. And so it maybe now has that much capacity. And then next time you might be able to go just a little bit further and then land back in safety again. And that's the way our nervous system capacity grows. If we do too much too soon, if we don't follow the titration and we go like really big, then we often get like flooded and overwhelmed. And maybe instead our ner our capacity goes like zoop, and we're like, I'm never doing that again. That was awful, uh, way too much. So titration is a way to go like little bits at a time. Um, in a workout format, that would be embracing modifications and picking lower intensity levels. Outside, it's on only going to places with a certain amount of exposure that feels manageable and then getting back home safe and being like, okay, that was a good amount. Maybe next time I might be up for a tiny bit more. This next bullet is about pendulation, which is what we call the experience of having a bit of a nervous system stretch and then returning back home again. So the pendulating between a stretch and a rest. And we can do that even when we're outside by letting our body attune to the resources that it has around it. So that's like uh, we just did a little bit of a climb that felt like a lot or we did a a run that was like fairly steep and like made me a little bit nervous and then when I get a second to pause I can look around and maybe notice that I have some really great friends around me who can help me out um, feel things like the um, maybe the snacks that are in your pocket or the your feet on the ground these are all ways to like help your nervous system pendulate away from the stress and back into safety allowing plenty of time for the backside of the wave to like actually come all the way down is a really big one for those of us who like kind of run at a pretty high place pretty regularly getting the nervous system to like become comfortable with a settling process can be a bit of a process and then this is a question for you getting to know yourself so that you can start to learn what safety feels like in your body so like what does your body feel like when it's safe. And that's maybe a little moment to pause, I'm throwing a lot at you. I'm curious if just with that question, if you have any initial thoughts, like what, what happens in your body when you know that you're like in a really safe place? Maybe right now, we're pretty safe right now, I would imagine if you're here on Zoom. Let me know. As we move into winter specific training, oh good, here's some comments, I love it. Haven't thought of that, about that before, uh-huh. Yeah, good to be curious about. One of the gens says, no tightness in my chest. It feels really tight when I don't feel safe. And real Jen says, breathing is easy and slower, mm-hmm. Breathing is slower, calm mind, like a, like a, maybe a slower pace to your thoughts. Yeah, for me, it's often breath, usually uh, like a shoulder softening sometimes, and maybe a little bit of like less tension along my spine. Oh yeah, noticing that you're, you like have appetite is actually a really great clue that you are, your body is feeling safe. I think that's a really good one. I'm actually able to eat and drink rather than being in full survival mode and breathing into my belly and not in my 
chest and relaxing my jaw. Oh my gosh, jaw is a big one for me too. And one that I've started to be able to notice when my jaw is tense versus when I'm like able to feel safe and some of that tension might spontaneously release. Yeah, really nice. So these are great things that you have uh, started to build some awareness around. I love it. Uh, the invitation would be to keep kind of tracking what what how your body is like navigating when I feel like I'm on the on the wave versus when I feel like I'm on the back side of the wave and come down and feel like I'm back to feeling safe again. Okay, we're gonna wrap all this together here after I cover a few of these winter specific training ideas. So this is now when we're thinking about, so we've got like the nervous system training aspect. Now, if we're thinking about fitness for winter, there's a lot of things we want to incorporate. Here's my overall list here, full body functional fitness. In general, in the winter, we're managing instability so surfaces that aren't stable underneath our feet, imbalance, surfaces that aren't flat, so we have to be on weird angles and navigate that. We're often navigating slipperiness, funky unplanned movement patterns, that's what I call like all the like weird turns that you have to like navigate in the body by uh, doing weird twists and funky things that you would have a hard time training for. In general, we're maybe falling and figuring out how to fall and and have the body be able to absorb the impact of a fall hopefully without injury and then to be able to successfully maneuver in the mountains we need power we need i should have put endurance on there it definitely belongs there torque is the experience of creating a twist inside the body that can allow like when we create a twist in the body then the untwist of that creates its own uh, uh, ability to power a turn if you're a skier in general we want soft landings because that's going to help our body survive longevity outside when we can land and absorb the body weight as we're landing and then I put stable knees on there because knee injuries are one of the very most common things that happen in winter sports, especially for women, uh, especially ACL injuries, which I uh, am very familiar with. I tore both of my ACLs when I was in high school and had surgery for them and rehabbed them and have um, been managing that ever since. But uh, so ACL, Prevent, injury prevention and rehab is a big part of the work that we do when we're training for winter sports and I have a link on there and I can put it in the chat if that would be helpful um, for you to go look at a video that um, walks you through a test about your risk for ACL injury and gives you some ideas for how to train to prevent it. There's a lot of good stuff there. Anybody here have experience with ACL stuff? I think a lot of us have. Oh my gosh, I brought the screen share back up and now I can't see the chat. Let me see if I can get it back. I'm looking right at, at it right now. I don't know, maybe, maybe in this group, we don't have a lot of people who have had any ACL injury. I love that. Yep. Good, good. Keep it that oh, way. Oh, there we go. Right, right. <laughs> Helen Meniscus. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Jen. Oh, yeah. That was probably when you yeah. were Helen Telly skier. Yeah, it's so common. Such a bummer when it happens. Uh, and there's quite a lot we can do to prevent, but um, also there's a lot we can do to rehab if it happens to be something that you run into in the course of your outdoor time. Yeah, okay, so let's move from here to some of the exercises. And this is the point at which I'm going to switch to AirPods so I can move away from the screen and hopefully you can still hear me. And then, um, yeah, essentially, so we're talking about the, let's see, are you still, are you hearing me through AirPods now? That happened? Okay, good, wonderful. 
Okay, so this would be a warm up would be the uh, beginning of the nervous system wave and a nice way to bring your body into a little bit of intensity before going into full intensity in the mountains. So I always love to encourage a little bit of a warm up before you actually go skiing or go snowboarding, go out in the mountains, even if you know, there's a ton of injury prevention reasons to do this, but if you think about it from a nervous system perspective, if we're able to slow that ramp up for our nervous system, it's more likely that our body will actually feel more capable and prepared and maybe less overwhelmed and less uh, scared up at when we do reach that peak intensity if we've been able to experience a little bit of intensity and activation on the way there. So we don't jump from like zero to 11, we go through from zero to three to six to 10 ish, or maybe we may even stop at nine. So we're not all the way up there. So a little warm up that I uh, is part of our ski babes um, workouts, and you're welcome to join if you want. We start by just crossing the arms from side to side. And this helps open up the chest. And very often we need this after a day at the computer. <laughs> and then you add a little bit of a knee bend in. So you are working into the joints in the knees, hips, and ankles. Probably gonna be better if I take the screen chair down, huh? I'm like super tiny. Yeah, good, okay, it's working. Let me stop the share so we can, uh, you can see me a bit bigger. Yeah, I think that'll help. Yeah, so we've got like, okay, crossing the arms and tapping, and then the knee bend, starting to drop lower and lower in as your joints feel warm enough. And then we'll rotate around. So we get a little twist in the spine for a couple, and then we'll reach up and over. So it's a squat with a lateral reach. These are all dynamic warm up moves. So we're trying to get some stretching going and build heat in the body at the same time, which I can certainly feel already. Maybe you can too. Yeah, and then so after that, I like to do a couple butt kicks. This one's a stretch for the quads and it warms up the hamstrings. So we like that. And then if you want to add like some speed to it, you could get into a little bit of a sprint and actually bring your heart rate up a bit and then slow it back down and see if you can feel that backside of that little wave that we just did. Yeah. And then there's a high knee march. Swinging the arms. Yep. So this one is helping us activate the core, which of course we're gonna want for whatever exercise we do, especially outside time. And then the last part of the warm up that I like to do is wide, widen out the feet and the hands. And we'll take the right hand down toward the left foot and then back up. And then the left hand down toward the right foot and then back up and we'll move through that a few different times. Is a stretch for the hamstrings dynamic warm up. And we want to at the top, think about your butt squeezing forward and pressing to the front up as you stand up. And then we're going to be working, warming up the posterior chain in that back body that we want to help us as we climb and descend. Yeah, great. Okay, so there's a little quick dynamic warm up for you. Uh, the next few, I have a couple of my favorite moves that I would love to do, or at least demonstrate or join me. Um, if you happen to have a yoga block, let's do some stagger squats. If you don't have a yoga block, uh, let's say yoga block folks, we're gonna put like one foot up and the other one down. If you don't have a block, you'll just lift the heel of the back foot. So the one foot is up in the air. And we wanna play with this move. 
This is our imbalance practice. So we'll do some squats in this unbalanced position. So you've got one foot elevated and one foot down or one foot flat on the ground and one foot with the heel lifted. And so I'd have you just do a couple squats in an imbalance position. Yup. And then now I'm just curious, bring your attention to where your body weight is here. And what does it feel like? Where does your body weight go naturally? What does it feel like if you weight the upper leg a bunch and do a squat there? What does it feel like if you weight the lower leg and do a squat there? What does it feel like to even out your weight balance, like even-ish between the two feet? What's the most stable weight balance ratio? And then we can take a pause. That was plenty for that. Yeah. Take a little break and shake it out. So this was a little bit of an interval of up into a little bit of intensity and exploration. We'll shake it out and give the body a chance to come down and relax and come down the back side of the wave. Maybe breathe. <sighs> Release. And let's just, because we did one side, we better do the other one. Let's try it over here and see if the side feels any different. So one foot up, one foot down, or that heel up. Do a couple squats here. See what happens. Like, where does your body weight go when you're not really tracking it? And then what happens if you load up the upper foot a bunch and do one there? And then the lower foot. And then what about like splitting the difference? Can you match 50-50 on both feet? And then see if there's a way, like a place that feels most stable for you and what ratio or weight balance that would be. Yeah, and then when you're ready to take a break, feel free to take a little bit of a break. This exercise, I love this one for winter sports because of the emphasis on uh, analysis of where your weight balance is, felt sense of stability in an unbalanced uh, world. <laughs> and then because we're actually, especially if you're skinning, you're often on one, like uh, you often have a body position that's quite a lot like this one we just did. And also skiing down, there's very often a difference in where your two feet are. So, you know, with this exercise we just did, there is no like right way to get the weight balance. What we want instead is the ability to kind of know where things are and adjust the pressure according to what the terrain is requiring of us. So just notice if like you always go to one place and then what we might want to start building is the ability to like move that weight around. Good. Lost the chat again. Let's do another one. Okay, so this one we talked about, I mentioned torque as one of the things that we want in the body for winter. This is a ski twist. So for this movement pattern, we're going to be rotating the hips and the knees and the ankles to one side and keeping the chest fairly straight as if you're skiing like chest downhill kind of thing. We'll do a squat here, maybe you're like reaching down here. And then we'll come up, move through center, rotate to the other side, and again, keep the chest fairly square. So that's a ski twist, and you can do it slow, or you can speed it up, hop it, make it like big. But one thing I'd love for you to start to feel in the body with this one is what happens if your knees, hips, and ankles rotate in one direction and your chest rotates in the other and you compress you have a torque going in the body and then this just naturally is going to want to untorque and power your your turn so there's a little bit if you can get your chest to lead the turn there's a little bit of it's like a slinky kind of spring loading that can happen in the body and get maybe some support 
from that torsion into some turns. Yeah. People tell me this is a, that they've benefited from this exercise, especially if they don't live by a ski slope <laughs> and they don't get to go downhill that often to be able to practice the movement pattern and the muscle memory. You might find that it supports you out on the slopes. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have, hmm, I have a couple more I want to do. One is, um, let's do a slipping one because we're all going to be in slippery situations in the next few months. Uh, Anchorage is really icy right now, but uh, whether, we, whether or not you mean to be on slippery surfaces, uh, this one, I've got, a, I've got socks on and a hardwood floor, so I've got some sliding ability. If you don't right now, like sometimes we'll have people bring a dishcloth or we have uh, these gliding discs actually in our workouts that slide under on the floor too, but either be on a surface that your foot can slide on or just imagine it. And we'll do what's called a center loaded lunge here. So we're keeping our weight on the center foot and sliding partial weight out to the side. And then the slip, the sliding is one thing. And then on the return up, we're gonna drive into the heel of this, this foot and use the inner thigh of this leg to come back up to, to center. So it's a lunge and back up. And that would be one of the places to work this movement pattern. If you wanna play with a little bit more slipperiness, we can push out as if we lost a little bit of control and slip and catch. So the slip with one leg, the catch with the other. Yep. And then feel how much loss of control with one foot requires power to catch on the other side. And then you can even, like in the next stage of this is to imagine slipping in a few different directions. What happens if you slip? all over the front, the back. Sometimes we slip behind. Yeah. Some of the studies of aging say that um, we think of balance being one of the issues with aging and why people fall. But what they're learning is that uh, just as much as balance is a concern, the power to catch a slip requires so much from the body, <laughs> that that is another one of the things that we can work on keeping up on. Let's try the other side before we get too wild. <laughs> nice and steady to begin on the second side, driving down through the heel of this leg, pulling in through the inner thigh over here. And then there's the Slippy version, micro slips. So like my foot got stuck. <laughs> Little slips. And then maybe bigger slips. You could make it like real dramatic. Ah, nice. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then you can slip all over the place. You can slip to the front. Slip to the back. <laughs> I knew the Coalition Snow folks would get into this. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, and then feel how much it requires from the standing leg to catch you. Getting slippery, getting hot. Better take my shirt off. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> I wore this for you, Jen. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So good. So these are a few of the winter specific exercises. And then now we are on a backside of the wave with potential to bring the intensity down. And one of the ways that I love to do that is by a little bit of balance practice. One of my favorite moves for that is the sexy skin rip. So for that, we're going to imagine we're backcountry skiing. And those of you that <laughs> don't know this, 
uh, movement pattern, you can just play along. We'll imagine that we have skis on our feet and we're scooting along and we uh, get to the top of the peak and we need to take our skins off. So to do this, we're gonna see if we can do it without taking our skis off our feet. Uh, we're gonna lift this one of our feet up and have to, this it has a ski on, right? So we wanna get it, this, we wanna reach the tail. So I actually like to like bring it all the way out and across the body and grab from here, reach to the very back of the, of the ski, unclip the skin way back here. And then maybe after you've got a hold of this, you can hold back here, bring this foot forward, maybe set your ski down on the ground and then give it a good <laughs> sexy skin rip even better in imagination and then we better do it on the other side so same thing we got to get our other skin off now we're going to bring this foot forward way forward so far that you can thread the ski on the outside of the other foot reach way back with your hand and clip tail <laughs> way back there and then we're going to try reaching forward Maybe bringing this foot out and setting your ski on the ground and then give it a good oh. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's the sexy skin rip. And then your both feet go down on the ground. You're ready to go. <laughs> okay, so fun ways to build some muscle memory for outside time. As we do balance work, our nervous system tends to come down from the intensity of intervals. And our, our nervous system also tends to be able to gauge that's a little bit more safer if it's on one foot. Cause like if we were in a survival situation, we would probably not just be balancing on one foot. We'd be like doing something more active. <laughs> so there's like a sign to the body if you're balancing that you're probably not, don't need to be in fight or flight right now. So we like that. Okay. <sighs> I'm gonna drink some water and uh, move along. How are we doing y'all? <laughs> Definitely feeling warm. <laughs> you cannot do that with a split board. Okay, that's true. <laughs> Kaylee, I love your trail name. That's amazing. Stumbles. Yeah, it takes a lot to catch a fall, truly. And it's some of what is fun to practice if you're with the right crowd. So, okay, let me bring this. Um, yes, Kaylee, I can send you, I, we can get you this, the PDF of this. We're going to post the PDF, the follow-up PDF and the recording of this into backcountry beta as well. Good. Yeah, perfect. So um, the slides have, I think, maybe I, I think I'm missing one, but here's the warm up, a version of it that we went through. Here are some stagger squats. Um, here's the ski twists that we did. We skipped a couple here, but you could revisit these. Plank ski tucks are another way to help uh, work on that rotational strength and especially focus on the core. Snowboarders are a move for those of you who are on the snowboarder crew and for all of us. Um, when I teach snowboarders, we work a lot on tracking if your feet are, if your weight balance is in your toes, in your heels, if it's in your front foot or your back foot and what feels stable there between all of those different directions. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and then, okay, here's the sexy skin rip part, first part and the second part. So I think everything is in there except for the slipping one that we did. Oh my gosh, I lost you. Okay, I'm not seeing chat right now, but we're just going to keep going. Um, 
so the two last things I hear I want to cover on our agenda are two really common uh, things to think about with the nervous system in mind and our training and our winter sports. Uh, this, oh, I had, yeah, okay. So I had a picture earlier with Vanessa on it. This is Vanessa. She was in an earlier slide as well. Vanessa is our community manager at Mind and Mountain and Ski Babes. And um, she's a really incredible woman of color who is a backcountry athlete. And she t talks a lot about intersectionality in the outdoors and that weaves in here too. So um, when I talk about weakest link syndrome, what I am talking about is the experience of feeling like when you are the one of the slower people in the group, it can be really challenging for our mental health potentially. Sometimes it can be a really stressful place to be. And there are some nervous system reasons for that. Our nervous systems evolved to match pace with others. When we are babies, we have, we have these neurons called mirror neurons that are made to match what other people are doing. They, that's like what they do is they, they attune to the other humans that are around us and they try to match it. So when we are not able to be in mirror with the other people we are we are with it can it's kind of like a red flag for the nervous system and then especially when we're outside i think there is you know because if you think about how we as humans evolved from these like hunter gatherer groups who were going about the world making a hunt and then moving along to where we were going to hang out together we had to be able to keep up with the group to survive and that is embedded in our nervous system and in our bodies. So it's a real threat. It's a real survival thing when we are moving at a different pace than others. Send up these red flags in the nervous system and make our body wonder if it's going to be safe. And then the, on top of that, now we have cultural conditioning and our own intersectionality. If we haven't seen people like us outside in the outdoors, and if we have either marginalized identities or if we have a lot of conditioning from our earlier years around performance, around being the best, around, um, you know, if, if we're not sure if we really belong in the outside, sometimes keeping up is one of the ways that we like maybe feel like we actually prove that we do belong. And so when we are experiencing a slower day, which we all do, uh, it can it can really poke at all this stuff. So I uh, love to think about this all from a nervous system lens and think about how when we're doing workouts, we can practice moving at our own pace, maybe even moving at a different pace from the person who's teaching the workout. And that in itself might be its own nervous system activation because it might feel a little bit challenging in the body to be picking, going at a slower pace than what you see being taught. And then that itself is a bit of an activation. And then as we complete a workout or complete an interval, we get the chance to like have moved through that and recognize that we're safe again and that everything's okay. And we start to build the body memory of being uh, safe inside our own pace. Another practice I, uh, I recommend for this is noticing what happens in your body when you feel behind. That might mean, I just said it and my throat tightened up. So that's one of them for me. Uh, there might be some of that stress that we mentioned earlier about feeling unsafe, or you might notice some other things. Um, and then one of my favorite practices for this is the imaginary friend practice. This is where you imagine that you have a slower friend out with you and you actually have somebody else behind right now. Because I'm going to guess that pretty much all of us, if we have somebody, if we're outside with a slower friend, our feelings aren't frustration or judgment or impatience with them. Typically, our feelings are warmth and compassion and encouragement, and we really want them to be having a good time. So uh, if you can imagine what it feels like to feel like that toward a slower friend, it might be a little bit of a bridge to imagining that other people ahead of you might be feeling that toward you. So that is a practice. Okay, 
I got the chat back. Good. Okay, good. I'm glad it's hitting home. Wonderful. I love this stuff. Okay, I've got one more concept for us and then we're going to question time. This is a slide about activating healthy fight energy. This is, fight energy is one of the responses in the nervous system, right? Fight or flight, we kind of all have heard about that. And very often I think in the world, this is taught as like a survival response that is sort of a problem or something we need to figure out how to move out of. But there is on each of these nervous system responses, there is a healthy expression of each of these nervous system responses. And yes, Jen and I had a really good talk about this on the Juicy Bits podcast that just came out a couple days ago, because Jen is one of my teachers. You might not know this, Jen, but like I see you operate in the world with a lot of healthy aggression, healthy fight, and I love it. I love to see it. <laughs> so uh, so we basically the point here is we need healthy aggression in our bodies and in our lives, especially when we're outside, because to be able to like make a really aggressive turn or even to climb up a steep slope, we need some of that. It's a sympathetic charge in the nervous system. And so we want to be able to have a have a expression of that that actually works in our bodies. But it gets complicated because often the fight response is overcoupled with flight, fawn, or freeze, some of these other responses. And that relates back to often to conditioning and to intersectionality. If we haven't been, if we've had bad experiences with people who show fight um, in unhealthy ways, or if we've been conditioned to not be safe in our own fight, then our nervous system is usually going to come in with a different way. So for example, if you experience some uh, fight response, like if you want to charge down a mountain, but your uh, when you're ex when you're like trying to get yourself pumped up for that, you, what you one of the places your body goes is like let's just do this, let's get this over with. I can't wait till it's done. <laughs> that would be the an example of a flight response that might be connected to your fight. So that's what overcoupled means, like they're interrelated. If you go to a place of like oh I wonder what are people going to think of me when you start to get like pumped up and you're like can I do this? What are people going to think of me? And, or you're like gauging, you're, use, you're like looking for social clues as to if this is an okay thing to do. That's a little bit fawny. That's a little bit of like gauging safety in the social nervous system when your fight comes up. And then the personal favorite or the one that I'm the most familiar with is freeze. So with fight response is overcoupled with freeze. Sometimes the there's lots of options here, but very often it the feeling of overwhelm, um, sometimes like a teary feeling or else just feeling a little bit spacey and stuck might come in. So those are, there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, have mixed experience with fight. And in the, on the pathway toward decoupling these things, <laughs> getting to know what your own particular route of overcoupling is a really good place to start. And then there are a couple practices to help move your body into a healthy fight response that I will, uh, I will demonstrate and you're welcome to, to join me here if you'd like. So this is a VU tone. And what we're gonna do with a VU tone is make the sound VU on an exhale. And we're gonna try to get it to move all the way down into your viscera, down into your belly and through the vagus nerve and use the vibration of the VU tone to, this will uh, release a little bit of freeze if you have it. If you go into a flight response, this will uh, generally bring your flight response back to a little bit more of a centered response and same with fawn. So it, this has kind of like a way of interacting with all of the different over couplings. So let me show you a VU, you're welcome to join me or just to watch, it's a little bit silly, but it really works. So we're gonna do a big inhale and on the exhale, make a deep VU. And then 
as you reach the bottom of the exhale, we're going to let the inhale just come on in. And then see if you can just notice what might be happening in your body as that experience moves through. Which might be very subtle or it might be very obvious. Sometimes it's heat, sometimes it's coolness, sometimes there's like a memory or a body sensation. Sometimes you might want to do another one. And I will show you this next one as well. This is a vu with a growl. And so this is the, um, this is like the next step into like really looking for, like chasing down some of that fight energy. So this time on, as I vu, I will also be opening up my jaw just to the point of uh, just short of any resistance, maybe making a little bit of a snarl or a growl. So here we go. There's an inhale. Exhale. And then as you reach the bottom of that exhale, we'll take, let the inhale come in. And again, just noticing what's happening in the body. And as you notice, this last bullet point, this refers to somatic experiencing sessions. This is the one-on-one -on -one or small group work that it can sometimes take to actually undercouple these things or like decouple these nervous system body responses. This is stuff that is not just something you can change your thought pattern around it's actually a physiological mechanism happening inside of the branches of the nervous system so it does take some some patience some attention some skillfulness to be untangling okay how are we doing here's the final slide this is time to switch to questions see if you have anything more you would like me to talk about i have a few links here if you are interested in some of the other work that i offer our ski babes training works in six week cycles and starts the monday after thanksgiving our next round uh, winter healing circle is where i'm doing this some of this deeper nervous system and somatic experiencing work and some other places to be in touch so I'll drop those links in the chat. I'm gonna pull this down so I can see your faces again. And now we're back. Thank you, that was awesome. I don't know if other people- You're welcome. But put them in the chat if y'all have questions. Yeah, I love this stuff so much. So thanks for giving me a spot to share about it. It's uh. Yep. Always yeah, fun. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, if no one has any questions, um, definitely put those links in the chat, Sarah. Um, we'll also be posting this, um, recording and a, the PDF into backcountry beta so that people can, um, rewatch it. Um, yeah. And I'm just reading the chat. Everyone loved it because it's great. <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought there. Oh, I was going to say, if anyone didn't put their email in the chat, um, if you came in late, put your email in the chat for me. Um, but I think most people got their emails in there. So yeah do you have anything else sarah i feel pretty complete it's been a real joy to be here with you all and talk about some of these favorite topics and help get ourselves all ready for winter it's gonna be a good yeah. season yes it will i definitely need to do some some of those off 
off kilter ones because I could definitely feel that. I was like, oh, my knees don't feel very supportive right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah Jen. isn't that interesting? <laughs> Let's try to make scary. everyone do that. that and I'm too oh, I just <laughs> Sorry, I was writing down someone's email before it goes away. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. Sarah, this was awesome. And everyone should go check out more from Ski Babes and um, see what all Sarah has to offer because it's really, really, really cool stuff. Um, and so we'll be posting where to find you again in the clubhouse, just in case none of you are clicking on those links now. So thank you. And everyone else I'll see you in the clubhouse. You can always reach out to me um, and I'll get this in there as soon as we can. So thanks, everybody. Amazing. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you later. Thanks so much.